Are the US government trying to control your mind? Let's find out in this episode of Dijon Science Exposed. So you probably guess I'm talking about Harp. No, I'm not on about the famous Muse live tour album featuring such songs as Supermassive Black Hole and Hysteria, but the High Frequency Aurora Research Program in Alaska. The High Frequency Aurora Research Program, or H-A-A-R-P for short, is a very controversial subject, as Nick Belgic, the author of Angels Don't Play This Harp, will agree. You only need to Google its name before you're swamped with conspiracy after conspiracy about how it's been designed as a weapon to be used for global weather manipulation, playing with Mother Nature, triggering floods, earthquakes, droughts, hurricanes and thunderstorms and attempting to flip the Earth's magnetic poles. Some people also believe it's responsible for downing planes, power outages and even more far-fetched theory that it's been developed as a use for mass population mind control. But what's it really used for? HARP is what's known as an Ionic Research Instrument, or IRI, which has been developed to study the procedures that occur naturally in the Earth's ionosphere, which is part of the protective bubble that surrounds our planet, keeping the atmosphere in and cosmic radiation out. The problem we're having at the moment is that there are certain disturbances in this bubble that affect our global and satellite communications, which isn't a good thing when you're trying to fly a plane across the Atlantic or your ship is using a GPS and it suddenly thinks it's somewhere it's not. The practical aim of HARP is to better global and space communications by working out what exactly happens in the ionosphere that causes problems with radio communications. So how does it work? HARP consists of two main parts, the most famous being the large array of antennas it houses and the observatory, an array of sensors that detect changes in the ionosphere. The antenna array is a 33 acre field of 180 cross dipole antennas, antennas that have two poles arranged in a cross shape, that are capable of delivering a power output of 3.6 million watts into the atmosphere which is about enough energy to power a small city for a day. That may sound a lot, but when you consider that the effect that it has on the ionosphere is tens of thousands of times smaller than the sun has, it's not exactly going to cause a big hoo-ha, is it? The idea is that they excite a portion of the sky, around 100 to 350 kilometres high, a few kilometres wide and a few hundred metres thick, and see what effect it has on satellite and what we call sky wave communication. I'll get to that in a minute. This excited area, the fluctuations it causes in the ionosphere, and the natural fluctuations are then monitored and examined by the guys sat in the HARP observatory. This information can then be used to develop better global and satellite communication systems. See? Simple. Its location in Alaska means that it's positioned in a place that experiences a broader range of ionospheric disturbances, so it's ideal for them to collect a more widespread range of data that can be applied to atmospheric phenomena around the globe. And it also means it can experiment on the different characterizations of disturbance from one single site. However, there are other sites dotted around the globe that also carry out ionospheric heating experiments and research, such as HIPAS in Fairbanks, Alaska, which is currently being reconstructed, the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, ACECAT, the European Incoherent Scatter Scientific Association Ionospheric Heating Facility in Tromsø, Norway, and the Sura Ionospheric Heating Facility in Vasilsursk, Russia. So what does HARP do for us? The practical uses of HARP are, well, non-directly, but the influence the data will have on other fields of research will eventually make our lives better. There are many communications which are made possible by the fact that the ionosphere reflects radio waves around the Earth, which is great seeing that we live on a giant ball and line-of-sight communication normally runs out of range pretty quickly. This reflection of radio waves around the globe is what we call sky wave propagation. Another problem that ionospheric disturbance causes is communication with the higher frequency systems like satellites, space stations and other things floating around in space. It's a bit like looking through a funhouse mirror or trying to see the world through a magnifying glass. Everything gets distorted and mixed up which is a bit of a problem when you're trying to ping a message through a satellite floating out in space. If they can work out why sky waves don't get bounced as well by certain disturbances in our ionosphere and how extraterrestrial communications get garbled by them, then we can develop better communication systems, which in effect will result in more accurate GPS location fixes, better communications between planes and ships going overseas, and just overall more efficient global communications. Which is really where the conspiracy theories stem from. I mean, if you're a defence organisation whose job and lives all depend on lightning fast communications, you're going to be very interested in something that can improve those communication systems. Which is probably why HARP is largely funded by the United States Air Force, the US Navy and DARPA, the Defence Advanced Research Projects Agency. The funding is a huge red flag for conspiracy theorists who only think that the government is out to get us, which really 
who can blame them? But logically, it does make sense for defense agencies to be very interested in Harp's research. But come on, mind control, it's a little too much sci-fi, even for me. Other concerns away from the conspiracy theorist ideals of a world where the US government is trying to attack the weather system are real issues that do actually have a place in normal society. It is kind of worrying that we're a team of people beaming millions of watts of energy at the bubble that protects us from things that would otherwise kill us. You can see why there are thousands of people that disagree with it, and why there is a somewhat small, yet present, global concern about it. But the reality is they're only trying to recreate on a very small scale atmospheric disturbances that occur naturally anyway. They aren't trying to modify the way the atmosphere works, or even do anything with it that permanently alters it. Any effects that they instigate disappear less than one millisecond after they cease their IRI transmissions. You will find pictures on the net that are said to be the harp transmitter in action, but the truth is, there are no visible effects. The only remote connection between the images online and reality is that they do detect a very faint glow in the ionosphere when the transmitter is switched on. But it's certainly not something that the naked eye could pick up, and it's only detectable by HARP's observatory. As for the government-related conspiracies, all data collected from HARP is widely available on the internet, and the project is deemed unclassified. The team at HARP are dedicated to keeping their experiments as transparent as possible, and conceal nothing from the general public, as explained on the website. All things considered, I think that the research that the HARP team are carrying out can only better society. Improved global communications will benefit everyone, from you guys at home watching videos on the internet to people across the globe fighting to make the world a better place. But you have your own opinions, so why not share them in the comments section below? What are your thoughts on HARP? Do you side with the conspiracy theorists or the scientific community? Either way, if you'd like more information on HARP, why not check out the Wikipedia page and the official HARP website. Links to both are in the description below. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Dijon Science Exposed. Don't forget to tweet us your science questions or leave them in the comments below. Thanks for watching.